I am uh, David Scare, and uh, I teach in the area of Systematic Theology and New Testament at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. And uh, by the time you uh, have an opportunity to watch this podcast, we will be approaching Ash Wednesday. Now, a few thoughts have to be spoken about Ash Wednesday, and that is, for most of us, uh, Ash Wednesday will be an evening service, uh, which means that uh, the sermon, is, is for an evening service, the sermon has to be a, a little bit briefer, shorter than what we do on a Sunday, uh, simply because uh, the people who are still gainfully employed are going to have to get up the next morning. So we have to be very careful about the number of hymns we choose, the length of the hymns. Um, boy, I would go for 45 minutes, no, no longer than 45 minutes, especially since some of you are going to have the imposition of ashes. I am not a, an advocate of that, not opposed to it, but we have to take this into consideration. Uh, the, other the other thing is that we might want to do the Ash Wednesday service uh, at noon simply because the uh, average age of our co congregational members are getting, is getting up there. They're retired and they are sometimes reluctant to go out at night. So we bring all of these, we, uh, these things in consideration because we, we make these suggestions because we intend, we, certainly it is our intention, all of our intentions, that the church calendar remain intact. Now, so far as uh, Ash Wednesday is concerned, is that uh, it is the one church holiday, a commemoration, that has to do with our condition. It has to do with mortality. It has to do with aging. It has to do that we're all on the way to the grave, some of us closer, some of us further, but the destination for all of us is the same. So whether we use the term ashes or dust, that, is, is, that doesn't really matter. It has to do with the disintegration of our existence. This is the one time of the year that we do it and we are approaching uh, the, the Lenten season and which it is quite customary for people to show their dependency on God by depriving themselves by, by that. But they're, by depriving them things of one thing, whatever it is, whether it's alcohol or whether it's meat or whether it's sugary products, sugar products, whatever it is. There's, it's a statement that they realize that this world is not all that important, that we can give up one thing and we are really not giving up anything. It's a statement that we are dependent upon God. God's not dependent upon us. And uh, we are aware, it's, a state, it's also a, it's a statement or a confession that God is the creator, he is the redeemer, and that we, ha we, we, we cannot rely on ourselves, we have to rely on him. And if we are uncomfortable in our, in our Lenten practices, in depriving ourselves of certain, of certain things, uh, we are making a statement that we depend upon God for everything and that the things of this world do not matter. So with that brief introduction into the Lenten season, let us take a look at the pericope. It says, uh, we, um, in behalf of Christ, we beseech you, be reconciled to God. Uh, be reconciled to God uh, because God made him to be sin. God... God made, in behalf of us, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, actually, we really wouldn't have to go too much further with this pericope and having something to preach about because this is really uh, 
the heart of traditional Lutheran theology. It's called the Great Exchange. Christ became sin. We became God. We became righteous. He who was sinless, as Paul writes, who, who, who knew no sin, God regarded him as sin. And we, who were only sin and had no righteousness in ourselves, uh, now become righteousness on account of Christ. Now, it's, it's among the things, you, when you find out, when you, when you talk to the people, and you, never, you, you, know, you will find out that the very basic things of the Christian religion may not be so basic to them at all. And, uh, and that, of course, that, de that depends upon how we preach. And that we, we spend a lot of time looking for a good introduction to a sermon, a good an eye for the introduction to the sermon. I think it's a good idea to mention various Lenten practices. Uh, the world, which really has very little use for Christianity, seems to have to give some attention to Mardi Gras, which means the last day that you can eat fat, and with a tip of the hat to Lent or to Ash Wednesday, the, t the period of deprivation. It's sort of like New Year's, but a little bit more somber. And that is you make uh, New Year's, New Year promises. So Lent is kind of negative. You're not going to make yourself better. You're going to do various things too, so you can realize uh, how bad, how bad you are. And um, I, it has to be preached that the value of Christ's death, Christ's life and Christ's death, is that God would be reconciled to us. And uh, now hear it that we should be reconciled to him. And uh, it's common... I, when people think about God, apart from Christianity, and they come across with two unusual ideas, which are really opposed. Both, both ideas are true in conjunction with one another, but not true within themselves. And that is that God is absolutely angry. Uh, that's why people don't like to see clergy persons, because they represent... The, the law of God coming with anger into their lives. The other is that God really is quite a good guy. And no matter what we do, the man upstairs, he's going to take care of us. Now the pastor, and you know this from your own experience, hits both of these things. Here the passage assumes God has already been reconciled. Now we're getting, we are moving from Ash Wednesday right to Good Friday. That the death of Jesus, by the death of Jesus, God has reconciled the world to himself. And this cannot be said, this cannot be preached on enough. Um, that with Christ's death, we are in dealing with the, uh, with the intricacies of the Holy Trinity that God is just and that he is good. And he really has, he have, in coming to our aid, in coming to our aid, he was at first satisfying his own situation within himself. And that is, God is eternally love. But he also is just. And if he reconciled if he brought the world, if he forgave the world without ha handling uh, the evil which we have done, then he would have been unjust. He would have been, he would have been amoral. He would, he would have no morality at all. He would say, really, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether you sinned or not. So the solution to the divine dilemma is that God has already reconciled the world in Jesus Christ. 
We can speak about the free will of God, but I think we should be very careful how we speak about this. If God had not come to our aid, he would have, the world, we and the, we and the world together would have been left in the situ, under the control of Satan. And Satan would properly be called, as he is in the Gospel of John, the God of this world. So we will really have two gods, a dualism. Gods in the heavens, all right with the world. And another god, Satan, has taken the world as his own, and there he, is, he rules supreme. He rules supreme in, this, in the children of disobedience. It's not that Christians are always obedient, but disobedience means the failure or the outright denial that God is in control of the world. So here it comes and it says that we, that's, that's in verse, that begins the pericope in first, 2 Corinthians 5. Be, be reconciled to God. That is a great, that is a great passage. That is, get over. I don't think this can be emphasized enough. You know, a lot of people carry a grudge about God. Um, anybody who is not a member of the church, let alone those who are already in the church, have grudges against God. I mean, this is part of our pastoral ministry. In speaking to people, we discover that it's not that they are simply without religion, but they have they have a, they have a they have something to they have an axe to grind with God. Either God has taken their spouse, their child, they've lost their job. There is something in their life which is an excuse for them, which is a reason for them to have no use for God. And here Paul is saying, God has reconciled himself to you. Consider that. Now reconcile yourself to God. And here we get a word, uh, the minister should not preach about himself. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a, always a, t a temptation uh, to bring up something from his own. But this happens. This is Paul's argument. If you're not able to reconcile yourself to God, Paul, Paul, Paul uses this argument in many places. If you don't believe what he says, you're saying that his ministry is useless. This is what the argument is here. He says, if you are still going around with a chip on your so uh, shoulders and grudges against God, if that's the way you look at life, then everything which we have done up until this time has been in vain. So, <laughs> yeah, this is uh, a person sets off a business. Doesn't work out so well. It was all in vain. A person goes to college and gets a degree. But the, the subject for which he studied doesn't produce any, any economic advantage for him at all. It was all in vain. In fact, that is the story of life. <laughs> That's the capitalistic system. I don't know what the statistics are. Maybe it's only one out of every 10 companies that are established, succeed. It was all in vain. The money was in vain. The time was in vain. All down the tube. And this is what he's saying here. If our ministry is to have any value at all, for heaven's sakes, be reconciled to God. Now that argument is a little bit, I don't want to use the word cheesy or corny, but it's real. It's real because there is the pastor. There is St. Paul. There are the, all the preachers who have ever lived. Does their ministry have any value at all? Should they have tr tried uh, and gone another way? And then 
he holds himself up uh, of the, you know, the minister really can't put himself forward as an example to the congregation. But why not? Paul does. And now he goes through the things that he has endured, um, that he has endured for the, for, for the sake of uh, for the sake of the people. And um, it's quite it's quite a list here. And I'm going to read it in English, and I'm going to look at um, I'm going to uh, look at the Greek from time to time. He calls himself uh, in verse four that we are servants. We have been established. We, we have been est established as servants of God. Now he doesn't use the word doulos here. He uses the word diakonos. There's a difference. A diakonos, a servant, maybe it means another kind of a slave, but it really doesn't mean that at all. It means one who, this is the word, our English word minister. It means the one who, who acts with the authority of God and in God's place. That's what it means, the diakonos. The best correlation happens to be the, the European countries that have... Uh, the ministerial form of government. They don't call their uh, cabinet, the, the leaders of their government, the officials in their government, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Commerce. They call them ministers. And there's a reason for that. Because the minister is accountable to the monarch. It could be the president, but it could call them to the president or the monarch. That's who he's accountable to. So Paul is speaking here of his accountability to God and what he has gone through here. And one wonders, uh, this certainly shows the way he rattles these things off. It indicates that he's not writing these things down, but that he is speaking and uh, because they, they come off, they really come in absolutely no known order at all. He says... Um, he, he has suffered very, he has suffered, he lists them out in troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, in riots, in hard work. You take a look at this, by the way, when it says here imprisonments, well, he was thrown into imprisonments in, in Ephesus, in riots, uh, in riots, there were where, where he went and preached. There was riots would break out because of his enemies. And you see that today, that if if someone doesn't like a certain political idea, the opponents arrange a riot and do not don't let the individual speak. And how about in hard work, in sleepless nights, sleepless nights? I suppose wondering whether he was going to wake up the next morning alive at all. Sleepless and wondering whether he had done God's will. Sleepless in the fact that he was tormented by, by his own ministry, whether he was always doing the right thing and whether God was had any, any use for him at all. It is hunger and patience and Holy Spirit and the power of God. And he did it with the... With the um, he did it with uh, the righteousness of God in all kinds of situations. Um, and then he, he, he mentions this. This is the... <laughs> yeah, you're the, you, most of us have been in the ministry for some time. Uh, to, know, to know that we are not always liked. That's hap that, that happens to be they used to be the, uh, the, uh, the topic for the Sunday dinner, the preacher's sermon. Uh, St. Paul says this. He was not always appreciated uh, uh, for his ministry. 
And maybe it was his personality. He could be very sharp. Paul, was a, Paul is clearly an, a competent theologian, not just a missionary, a competent theologian. And he expressed, he expressed himself in things that put birds under people's saddles. They were disturbed by what he was, by what he did. And so he says the reaction to his preaching, the reaction to his preaching was twofold. We were beaten, not killed. We were sorrowful, and yet in spite of this, our misery, we had reason to rejoice. They took all our money away, yet we were made rich, having nothing, and yet we possess everything. And so as he comes to the end of this particular section, he uh, gives a picture of the Christian life. Now, the Christian life is projected into his ministry, not as if that was two different things. Because what he endured in his ministry. Now, if you, I've had the opportunity to go to Turkey. There's where his ministry was really carried out. That is a huge piece of land, Turkey. And he walked across that. He traveled across that. And traveled across it more than once. And so the opportunity for him to suffer, to actually go through physical pain and agony, happened many times. So this, the ministry, just like the Christian life, never comes to a time of complete enjoyment and fulfillment. There is not a time when we say, that all these troubles are behind us. And that's, of course, the purpose of, of, of Ash Wednesday, is that we recognize that troubles are part of the Christian life. Now, part of the troubles which we bring upon ourselves at, on Ash Wednesday are artificial. That's perfectly good. Depriving ourselves of certain foods and pleasures is a kind of an artificial discipline but it's a worthwhile discipline because it signifies the, what, the, what, we, what, we, what we are going to anticipate, what we are going to anticipate in our lives. And that's the tragedy of the Christian life. The Christian, uh, the, this is a real problem with, uh, with some pastors. I mean, it's not an incidental at all in that some of our members have been attracted and will be attracted to other types of churches which satisfy um, the people's emotional needs. It's the music, it's the happiness, it's the philosophy of God wants you to be wealthy, God wants you to be healthy. <laughs> that's not the gospel at all. Nothing to do with Christianity. It's, it's an awful thing to say that's not really Christian. But it isn't. It's not at all. It's, the, it's the, what, what matters to be a Christian that in spite of our distresses, and the distresses can be physical ones, the ones, uh, sicknesses. It can be problems in the family. It can be problems in the business. As soon as we, go, as soon as we put one tragedy behind us, another one comes up. It would be better to have, maybe have a philosophy of I'm never going to get too happy and excited about anything because it'll only lead to a downfall or depression after that's over. But St. Paul speaks about, about what happened to him. He lists what happens to him. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. He's been arrested. And he's thrown in prison. Being thrown, being thrown in even in a prison today. We have a student, great guy, kind of forget who he was, but I just spoke to him on Friday four days ago, he was an officer in a prison. And I asked him, what does a prison cell like? He said, well, they got a, facility, a commode, a facility, and you got a bunk. If you want to sit down, you sit on your bunk. And that's what you have. The prisons of the ancient world were simply a hole in the ground. 
They let you in there. He was in prison, and it's not a question of whether you suffer from claustrophobia or not. You're going down in that hole. And they put a grade over it. He was imprisoned. There was enough reason for him to give up on Christianity. He says this, that in all of these deprivations, he was able to rejoice in Christ. Now, there you have the true Christian religion. Well, I hope you have a very blessed uh, Ash Wednesday. I hope that the service goes along very nicely. I always like the Lenten hymns. Somehow they have a philosophy here that Sundays are not part of Lent. Well, I don't know why not. That's, but the Lenten hymns, more than any other hymns, bring the suffering of Christ into the congregation and involve our people in the death of Christ and eventually in his resurrection. So thank you very much.